Hi guys, this is Shannon from Reptile Way and welcome back to our channel. Today's video is going to be all about these guys, green tree pythons. So that squiggle we've got up there is going to be helping us out today. But we're going to go over everything you need to know if you're getting a green tree python for the first time or you just want to make sure you're providing adequate care. But let's dive into this video. So green tree python's scientific name is Morelia viridis and we're just going to show you where they sit when it comes to their scientific classification. Uh, so we'll put that up on the screen for you to have a quick look at. Now originally green tree python's scientific name did used to be chondropython viridis but in 1994 they were actually reclassified but this is why you still hear when people talk about it in the pet trade they'll refer to them still as chondros um, but it is an outdated term so I do like to keep things quite scientifically correct as you may realize on this channel so I won't be referring to them using that term just so you know the reasons behind it. So what do green tree pythons look like? So here with Squiggle, we've got a beautiful example of what a baby green tree python can look like. They can come in yellows, oranges, or red colors. And then once they get to a year and onwards, they do start to change color into, uh, Squiggle will probably go into a vibrant green color, emerald green. Um, but depending on the locality and morphs, you can get them changing into other bright and beautiful colors. Um, but green is generally the most traditional one that we see out in Australia in the wild. Now they do generally have white or yellow scales running along their vertebral line also once they become adults. Now the size of these guys. So the average size of a green tree python is around about 1.5 meters, um, but they have seen green tree pythons get to as big as 2.2 meters, and the females generally are larger than the males. Now when it comes to the weight of these guys, the males can weigh about 1.1 to 1.4 kilos. The females can sit around 1.6 kilos. There have been some females recorded in captivity of weighing up to 2.4 kilos. Um, I think it'd be kind of rare to see that out in the wild. Captivity, it is a little bit easier to overfeed these guys. Distribution of the green tree python. So these guys can be found in Papua New Guinea, eastern parts of Indonesia, uh, Cape York Peninsula in Australia, um, which I definitely want to go visit and actually try find these guys in the wild. There is this YouTube video that I highly recommend and um, they're Australian YouTubers. Um, they've also got some really good building videos on there as well. But yeah, they actually do a trip to Cape York Peninsula and they've got some amazing footage of them finding green tree pythons in their natural habitat. So I highly recommend checking out that just to learn a little bit more about their habitat. So their habitat consists of tropical forest, rainforest, monsoon forest, with high humidity, dense vegetation, so a real jungle atmosphere. They are arboreal animals, so are often found in trees. Um, you know, on the odd occasion, they can be found on the ground, especially at night when they're hunting. Um, but when they're found in trees, they can be found in trees up to 30 meters off the ground. So definitely not afraid of heights. This is why Squiggle is absolutely loving this piece. Uh, getting a bit of climbing practice for its upgrade when it goes into a bit of a bigger enclosure. So information you need to know when setting up your green tree pythons enclosure. So first of all, the enclosure size. Now it's quite common practice to upgrade the enclosure as your snake increases in size. So we're just gonna put, I guess, a rough guide of some enclosure sizes on the screen for you. Now again, you don't have to follow it exactly. It's just a bit of a guide just to show you appropriate sizes. That's gonna make the animal feel comfortable. It's not gonna be stressed out. It can easily find water. Um, so we'll pop those up on the screen for you. So when it comes to a baby setup, um, you're more than welcome just to do like a plastic tub setup. This is generally recommended by most breeders because it's um, 
a great way to ensure that your animal is going to be able to find the water, it's going to be easy to feed the animal, easy to clean the enclosure as well because when they're younger they do eat a little bit more often which means they poo more often um, so there is a little bit more clean up when they are babies. This is Squiggle's baby enclosure, which is a plastic tub setup. You can see there's so many elements in here to ensure you're gonna have a happy, healthy green tree python. Lots of different perches that are different textures, different heights. We've got plant coverage to make Squiggle feel secure and um, different size water dishes at different levels to encourage drinking. So we're gonna show you how we made this particular tub set up um, so you can replicate it. We're gonna collect some branches from out bush. We're gonna actually scrape all the bark off with a knife, sand it down, then we're gonna soak it in some earth dishwashing liquid and bleach for a couple of days. You're gonna rinse it thoroughly, dry it in the sun, and you've got your wooden perches. Now we're gonna show you how to make some plastic perches with your trusty coat hangers you can get from your supermarkets, Kmart, that type of thing. You're going to snap it to the size, you can sand off the edges if they're a bit rough and we're going to use these to I guess thread through some holes that we're going to create in these plastic tubs and this is going to allow the perches to be removable. We're going to use this wood burner to create the holes to thread the perches through so you can see we're just creating holes that are going to be just large enough to thread those perches through but your snake doesn't escape. You can secure the perches from the outside with a strong tape like Gorilla Tape but then if you do need to take the perches out with your snake on it you can do that easy. You can just remove that sticky tape on the outside of the enclosure. But there you go. Now we're putting some fake vegetation in there so your snake feels secure and safe. And this is what the final setup looks like. And we do also have a humid hide, which is right there. You can put sphagnum moss in it and it is recommended for youngsters to assist with shedding. Perches at different levels, two different water bowls at different levels, different sizes, a lot of textures in there to help shedding. We're gonna put a secure lid on with air holes that have been burnt in. And yearlings and sub-adults, so about one to two years old, you're going to upgrade them um, to a slightly larger enclosure. And again, when you increase the enclosure size, you can put a few extra perches in there, um, a bit more coverage. So yeah, definitely add a few more things into your enclosure as you expand. Now, when it comes to the adult enclosure size, it can vary whether you've got a male or female, as they can be slightly different in size, with the females being a little bit larger. So therefore, it's recommended to have a slightly larger enclosure for your females. Now, the temperature of your enclosure. So like any reptiles, this is an extremely important factor. Generally, if you're not getting your temperature right in the enclosure, you're gonna find lots of problems um, happening with your snake, um, whether it comes to them not wanting to eat, regurgitation, them being stressed, um, them not looking so great. So you really wanna make sure you get your temperatures right, super critical. But you wanna split your enclosure into sort of two halves. You're gonna have a hot, and a cool side. So the hot side is where you're gonna have your heating element, whether that be a heat lamp or a heat panel, totally up to you. Your hot side, is, you're gonna want it at around about 30 to 33 degrees. I personally have mine set on about 30 to 31 degrees and that works quite nicely. And your cool side, you want it set between 26 to 29 degrees Celsius. Now you don't want to let the temperatures drop any lower than 21 degrees. Now UVB isn't really necessarily needed for these guys as they are nocturnal. Um, but if you do want to include UVB in your enclosure, just make sure it's not that strong um, as these guys can get UVB burn. So just make sure you're getting the appropriate UVB bulb for these guys. Now with the humidity, you want to set it around 50 to 70%. Now it can be slightly higher, especially after certain situations of just misting your enclosure. It may be slightly higher straight after you've done that and that's okay. So you want to mist or spray down your enclosure um, 
once every one to two days. But again, make sure you have something that you can accurately read the humidity for. Now you can also use misting systems um, that can be set on timers. You will have to play around with the settings just to make sure you're not gonna, I guess, uh, make the enclosure too wet and too damp. So make sure you get the misting conditions correct if you are using timers and all that sort of stuff before you actually put your snake in there. Now when it comes to ventilation, this is really important with green tree pythons. They can be prone to respiratory issues. So the way you can achieve um, adequate ventilation to make sure your lid is mesh, you can also have vent panels on the side. If vent panels are on the side, make sure your hot side, the vent panel is higher and your cool side, the vent panel is lower. And that'll just allow the air to circulate a little bit better. You can also get little fans to put in your enclosure or even place on top of the mesh lid to increase airflow. Um, it is gonna be a little bit dependent um, what fans you use, where to position them, depending on the size, shape of your enclosure. But all those things will assist you to achieve a well ventilated enclosure that should reduce the risk of your snake um, experiencing any sort of respiratory issues. Now when it comes to substrate for these guys, because they do like high humidity conditions, you want to make sure your substrate is the type of substrate that's going to hold that humidity quite well but it's not gonna mold. So I'm gonna put a list of different substrates you can use up on the screen. Um, my go-tos are these ones at the top. So the Coir Brick and the Sphagnum Moss, that can be purchased from Bunnings. The Critters Comfort Cocoa Fiber, that can be purchased from Pet Barn. And I like to use those three as a combination for lots of my enclosures. But also you can check out um, a video that we've got of a green tree python enclosure build. And we've actually got a nice bioactive substrate. And we explain um, the different types of substrates we've used to make that. So that's also a really good substrate to use for green tree pythons. Now when it comes to water, so getting your snake to drink, ensuring that there's water in the enclosure. A uh, common practice is people will generally have a large water bowl in the enclosure. That's gonna keep the humidity conditions quite constant and in the higher range. You can also mist the enclosure and when you're misting the enclosure, you can mist over the animal and sometimes they'll drink the water droplets off themselves or the things surrounding them like leaves or any surface that sort of holds the water. Um, just make sure if you are gonna mist over your snake, use a spray bottle, make sure the setting's nice and light so it does sort of have like a mist and it's not like a jet. Um, so, and also make sure the water isn't gonna be cold. So you probably want it to be lukewarm so you're not gonna dramatically drop your snake's temperature. However, Squiggle here does not appreciate being misted over. Um, Squiggle does not drink any water off itself. I've actually monitored Squiggle for an hour or so after I've misted and when I'm misting, sticks its head into its body and then, yeah, just is about angry for that next hour. So not all snakes will like it, but it's a good option if you're noticing your snake's a bit dehydrated of ways to try hydrate them and they might like that way when it comes to encouraging them to drink. These guys also do like running water as it closely mimics, I guess, the conditions they'd be drinking from in the wild. Especially when they have the monsoonal rains, you're getting water trickling down off leaves, that type of thing. So they're quite used to drinking running water and are sort of drawn to it. So you can have a little bit of fun with their enclosure and build something like a trickling waterfall like we did in this recent YouTube video build. Um, but just make sure if you are going to do a waterfall build, it's going to be easy to clean so you can keep it sanitary. And as well, you're not going to put it in a spot that the animal is going to be likely to defecate into, like being on ground level below all the perches. Um, I found that's been a big problem with people who have built waterfalls in a way that the big water hole is on the bottom because the animal will defecate into it and it can lead to a lot of cleaning, which nobody really wants. 
Um, so that's why in that build video we actually raised the water hole higher that the waterfall trickles into and the perches run along the side of the water hole and underneath and that should really reduce the chance of the animal defecating into the water hole and it's going to be a lot less cleaning. It is possible though to get your snake water bowl trained. However, a good way to encourage it to drink from its water bowl, like what I've done in Squiggles in baby enclosure, I've actually got three smaller water holes that are make up the size of a large water dish and they're scattered around the enclosure at different heights. So one that Squiggle uses quite a lot is the one that's up high near its favorite perch. That's a great spot to put a water dish. Um, then there's one at sort of a medium height and one on ground level. And this is just gonna give Squiggle all the opportunity to have a drink whenever it desires. So feeding, these guys wild diet consists mainly of small mammals, birds, um, lizards, frogs, uh, that type of thing. However, the smaller snakes, like squiggle size, have been known to eat things like beetles and moths out in the wild, so they're not really that picky. Now, in captivity, um, they will readily eat mice. Now, hatchlings or juveniles under one years old only need to be fed about every once every seven to ten days. So, squiggle is getting a little pinky mouse every ten days or so and that's great for squiggle. When it comes to adults, you can feed them once every two to three weeks. It's also best to feed the adults um, prey size that is equivalent to the thickness of their body. So this will ensure that you're not gonna feed them anything too bad that can lead to things such as prolapse issues, regurgitation, um, so yeah. Just use that as a bit of rule of thumb when it comes to determining the prey size for adults. Now they can have a tendency to regurgitate food when there are issues. So regurgitation is a sign that something can be wrong, whether that is the food is too big, their stress, the temperature and humidity levels aren't correct. Um, so just keep an eye on that. If you are noticing your animal is regurgitating, there is probably something wrong. If you are really struggling though, take them to the vet if you can't figure it out yourself, but they are some of the main causes. With some help from AB Reptiles Collection, we're gonna show you how to feed baby green tree pythons because they are a lot different to other species. You can see Bo from AB Reptiles here. She's actually touching the coils of the snake, giving it bops on the nose because you do need to almost make these guys a little bit angry to feed, which is so odd. I had the same with Squiggle. And what they'll do is they'll strike, miss, strike, let go. Um, so it can take a few attempts to get them to strike and hold on, which what this baby's just done now. So I'll show you another example with a different baby. So you're gonna see a few strikes that have missed, a few strikes that let go. So it can take a little bit of coaxing, but yeah, I found it quite interesting having to have to make these guys just a little bit agitated to get them to feed. But you can get quite lucky and maybe have a baby like this who feeds straight away. So the enclosure setup. So the things you really wanna make sure you include in your enclosure, you've got perches, um, and make sure you've got quite a few perches in there, multiple, so your snake can choose which perch it would like to sit on, whether it wants to be higher to warm up, down lower to be a little bit cooler. Uh, make sure the thickness of your perches is correct due to the size of your animal. Um, so you can see Squiggle has quite thin perches, um, and that's so its little tail can wrap around the end and there's not gonna be any spine tail issues. That can occur if you do have too large a perches for the size of your snake. Uh, so keep that in mind. Also cover is really important, whether that be having real plants in a bioactive enclosure or fake plants. Coverage over the perches can be quite nice. Having a few options on the cool side and hot side of coverage and on the different perches. Um, and that's just gonna make your snake feel nice and comfortable. It knows when it goes to a perch, it's got the option where it can have some cover and feel nice and secure. And I all the time find squiggle on perches that are directly underneath fake plant coverage. So squiggle uh, quite enjoys it. 
Also, don't forget your water bowl or multiple bowls. Um, also, you've got to pick your substrate. So make sure you pick a substrate that you can easily access where you're living and that's going to hold that humidity, but it's not going to mold. So a good little tip when it comes to looking at how to care for your reptiles, whether that be a green tree python or any other type of snake, what I really like to do is I like to look at uh, the local climatic conditions of where that snake is naturally found. So I check out the temperature and humidity over a significant number of years, get an average, and I can use that to, I guess, fact check care guides that I'm looking at and just to see the correct conditions this animal should be kept in. Um, so yeah, definitely always do that in addition to care guide videos. So some interesting papers um, for you to have a read of. Now this first paper is really good for finding a little bit more out about their natural habitat, especially here in Australia in Cape York Peninsula. It's got a lot of good information about their habitat as well as a lot of other stuff, but I don't have enough time to cover that paper in this video. There's also this other paper, which is quite an interesting read. It's sort of looking at the forensic approaches of how people can tell whether I guess an animal has been taken from the wild and is being illegally sold in the pet trade or whether it was actually born in captivity and is being sold in the pet trade. So another interesting read if you do love your papers. And again, this is something I highly recommend when you are getting a reptile. Scientific papers are a really good source to utilize. And again, for finding information about their natural habitat, which is so important when it comes to setting up your snake or any other reptile enclosure. So this book, The Complete Chondro, I highly recommend getting if you wanna learn a lot more about your green tree pythons. It has everything you need to know. So thanks AB Reptiles for recommending that book. So to finish up with, we're actually gonna show you how we went about building this piece. So you yourself can build it at home for your green tree python. We've even got these gorgeous removable perches, but Squiggle hasn't really been using them. See it as Squiggle's been on this fake plant it loves so much. But anyway, let's show you how we went about building this. I used some leftover foam boards I had from previous builds. I carved this out with a hot wire cutter and now I'm putting some Davco sanitized grout on to create almost this rocky natural feel. It's gonna create a bit of a rough texture, which is what you want when you're creating um, these rock features. But you wanna have a minimum of about three layers. The first layer that you can see we're doing is quite a thick consistency, that grout. So it's more like a thick pancake consistency. That's gonna allow you to fill in any air pockets in the foam, any sort of gaps you don't want there to be there. It's gonna give it that strength, that structure. And then as the layers progress, you're gonna get thinner and thinner. Now, once you've completed this first layer, when it dries, you will see a few cracks. Don't panic because as the layers get thinner and thinner and as you put more layers on, you can fill in all those cracks. So having cracks after that first layer of grout has dried is totally normal. And you can see I'm just making that surface a little bit more rough, a little bit more textured. Now we're doing the little boulder um, that you'll see will come into our build a little bit later, especially when it comes to adding the plants. Uh, but I just wanted to make sure those two big pieces weren't so symmetrical, so the boulder will help with that. Again, adding more grout on to create more texture and it's gonna look amazing by the time you carve it after you've done that third and final coat. 
But here we're doing the final coat. Now again, this is Davco Sanitized Grout. I think it was the dusty brown color. Um, and that's just because I wanted the undertone color to be more of an earthy color instead of a gray slaty color. And this consistency, like I said before, is gonna be a bit thinner. But now we're carving all those strata layers into the piece. So you wanna start carving when it's sort of almost dry but it's still a bit damp to the touch and that's when you can carve the best strata layers into your piece. You can use a knife, a sharpened chopstick, plenty of things. Get, make sure you've got like a clean paintbrush to brush away all the little bits after you've carved. But there you go, that's after the carving. Now we're going to use this gold paint that you can get from Bunnings um, to start our dry brushing. So if you don't know what dry brushing is, it's when you get paint on the brush, and this is acrylic paint, so it's you know water-based, non-toxic. Once you've got the paint on your brush, you're going to wipe most of the paint off your brush until you've only got a little bit, and then that's what's called dry brushing. You can brush it onto your piece. Um, don't add any water to the paint otherwise it defeats the whole dry brushing technique. And make sure that grout is completely dry as well because that will affect your dry brushing technique. Now for this second sort of different color, we're mixing that gold with a raw umber brown type paint. Mix them together and that's gonna give you more like a ochery, pinky sort of effect. We're finishing off with some white to dry brush at the end and that's just going to make it look like the wind's been ripping at it, the rain, it's going to look a little bit worn and more natural. Now we're going to go in with um, our pond sealer. So this is the waterproofing. So it's just going to make this product easy to clean if your animal poos on it, urates on it but it does sort of dampen the colours a bit. So the colours probably were looking a bit bright and a bit stand out. Once you're doing the waterproofing, it does dull everything down and make it blend a little bit more, so keep that in mind. You wanna do a minimum of three coats of waterproofing and then you're gonna do a fourth coat, but once you've done the fourth coat and it's still wet, you're gonna sprinkle some sand. And I'm using some sanitised play sand that you can get from Bunnings, making sure that sand is bone dry. And then I'm just gonna sprinkle it on the piece because I wanna give it, again, a bit of a rough, earthy texture. Now it's stuck to the piece quite well, just sprinkling it over once it was wet. But if you want to do a little bit more sand, um, you can also do some final coats of waterproofing over the top of the sand um, to make it really stay in place. And now we're putting in the fake plants and we're using this particular type of silicone. It's aquarium grade, totally safe for reptiles to glue all of the plants in so your snake's got, not gonna rip them out or push them over. And I didn't film all the plants being glued in, but this is what it looks like at the end. I got a lot of the fake plants from Spotlight. They have a great variety and Squiggle is loving this eucalyptus style plant. And um, I think it's in the bouquet section where you have all different fake plant cuttings and it's got a thick wire going through it. So it's really good for squiggle when it comes to climbing. Now, a big thank you to Bo from AB Reptiles. This has been a collaborative video um, and has provided me a lot of footage to use. Um, for the purpose for everyone to learn. So a big thank you to AB Reptiles for giving me some of your time and to use some of your footage as well as the knowledge that was provided as well. So definitely check out their Facebook page. And this collaboration video was so much fun. I love working with people who are as passionate as what Bo is from AB Reptiles about her green tree pythons. And um, so yeah, it was a really fun project to do and I just loved 
how amazing her animals look so healthy happy this particular bit of footage made me laugh so much I really wanted to include it at the end to put a smile on everyone's face but they are beautiful snakes so thank you so much guys for watching this video. I really do hope it did help you out a little bit. A big thank you to good old Squiggle up there who's done an amazing job. And please, if you did like the video, don't forget to hit the thumbs up. Hit subscribe to be made aware of future content. Otherwise, we'll see you next time. Bye guys.